That was perfect. So we're starting to we're starting to create movement, kind of that desirable kind of impact. In a, it's yeah. dynamic, but it's in re, it's in response to the the demands of this task. So we've changed so like the environment. A, a con- a constraint-led approach so like we we got the constraint here and then i'm just trying to figure out how can i make the solid contact yeah on the down slope. and and so hey guys thanks for watching be better golf really appreciate you guys clicking the video i think you're really going to like this video i got a new instructor on the channel somebody that i saw when uh one of uh you subscribers sent me an email of a lesson that this guy marcus bell was giving and i thought it was really interesting so let me let me uh, welcome Marcus to the channel. Hey, Marcus, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Brendan. Pleased to pleased to be here. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Oh, no problem, no problem. So uh, I don't want to speak for you too much, Marcus, uh, because I'd I'd rather hear you say it. But what is your philosophy on how pe- this is called be better golf? So what is your philosophy on how the best way somebody can get better at golf, and how do you think people usually go about it with golf, and how do you think that there could be an either easier or more direct and better way? Um, well, I think the traditional way has been to be instructed uh, to some kind of uh, concept or model um, and in, a, in quite a deliberate way. So there's conscious cueing, there's um, very much a more of a kind of deliberate execution of movement. So it's more of, it's kind of a, a building a golf swing, if you like, whereas... If you think about most sports, um, movement really just emerges. It emerges really uh, under the constraints of the game. So how you react to the environment, how you react to the equipment, um, and how you react to really the affordances. It's really about affordances. It's an opportunity for movement. Could you give us an example, like in a, in a sport other than golf, like what would be an example of a constraint that then affords uh, opportunities to learn? So for, I mean, for tennis. So for tennis, hitting the ball over the net. So hitting the ball over the net requires a, a swing. It requires a control of the face. It requires a, an angle of attack, um, a release. And just by effectively doing experiential training, experiential learning, you are starting to refine the movement so the body the body has a a huge amount of degrees of freedom available to it for mo- movement potential what the body's very very good at um is self-organizing that movement in response to some form of intention so it's the intention that's really really critical what what are we actually asking our body to do what are we responding to it's kind of um there are attractors that we are responding to in the game. Um, and that kind of starts to really influence how we react. So playing tennis, for example, hitting the ball over the net, where do you want the ball to land? This kind of thing is going to influence how hard you're going to hit, how much, how much speed you're going to create. And then you're going to start to uh, be creative and start to spin the ball, maybe top spin. So you start to play around with the angles and this is really all based around a perception of what you of, of the intention. So it's before we start even talking about any mechanics, we're really reacting to the game, the demands of the game, and we're starting to create movement really very intuitively. So you're saying that in in most sports, and certainly like as you and I have watched our kids learn to ride bikes and walk and stuff, uh, you're you're saying that the intention brings the mechanics yeah Um, and so it's the intention of trying to do certain things and failing in a lot of different ways is the thing that then starts to develop the mechanics how to me it seems like most golf lessons try to go about it the other way yeah absolutely most most golf lessons that that i've um, i've experienced or look on look to see on youtube and things like that work on more of a a reductionist approach so yeah so trying to get the, the pupil to adhere to some kind of, to conform to some kind of concept or movement. And they may not even possess a level of self-awareness to even achieve that. And it may not even be within the body's 
motor maps. It's 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 uh, it's constraints. It's um, the body's the body's um, it's able to adapt, but it needs it needs some form of cueing, some form of um, if you like. Um, it needs some it needs an intention, but but it also needs the opportunity to to self organize with variability. So we're not trying to be very specific. We're trying to allow the body to explore. It's a, it's a journey of self-discovery where ultimately your, your most functional pattern emerges. But the key to this is that it's able to adapt. So it's not a strict, rigid pattern. Um, it's, it's malleable. It's, there's plasticity to this system. So we want to play around with those, that variability and um, allow the body to optimize ultimately its own movement patterns. So we're not, we're not telling the body what to do, say. We are, we're allowing it to, we're listening to the body. Essentially, we are, we are, if you like, challenging the body because the golf swing is just a movement solution. So it's the body's movement solution. And if it's not providing the solution that you intended, then you've got to question yourself, well, maybe I'm not giving it the right information. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe my information is a little bit distorted. Maybe my attention is not in the right place. Maybe my awareness is, yeah, maybe distorted. And so, so really, it's it's defining clarity on the task, understanding what's what's required, and then allowing the body to react accordingly. So that's the that's the job of a coach is to create the the ideal learning environment for that individual. Uh, playing around with the constraints of the environment and ultimately I think developing a level of self-awareness heightening their heightening their attunement to what they actually do to what the body to how the body's responding a lot of people aren't even aware of uh, what their golf what their body's doing in the golf swing a lot of people they kind of think about the golf swing as as chunks of kind of movements yeah. that, they're, that they're piecing together so the backswing chunk, the transition chunk, the downswing chunk, the impact chunk, like that. Yeah, and it's like breaking down how you walk. If you were walking to open the front door, you wouldn't be taking it step by step by step and then breaking it down further. Yeah. Just walk to the door. Your body reacts accordingly. So for me, I mean, we're all our, we are all our own universe. Our perception on reality is unique to ourselves. It's very difficult for a coach to see something through somebody else's eyes and to associate any kind of feeling with that individual. What you feel in a golf swing, what I feel in a golf swing are completely different. How you interact with that golf club, how I interact with that golf club, we can't assimilate. We can't, we can't associate with that because with each other because we don't really know. So we're assuming. There's a lot of assumption. And we all know the feel and real thing. You only have to look at a lot of the golf books some of the most revered golf books in history, the guys who wrote them didn't even do what they were writing about. So if those guys haven't got that level of self-awareness, what does the average guy who comes for a lesson have? It's just how can we use the same system when even the most expert performers, even they don't have that, self, that, that, that high achievement of self-awareness? When I think about a, a, a regular golf lesson, no, when I was reading a lot of the, the literature on motor learning in the last six months or so, the uh, the idea of corrections keep coming up when the researchers and stuff are talking about corrections in motor learning. What what would a correction be? It's the coach telling the telling telling the pupil what they're doing wrong mm -hmm. in their eyes, and then it's a false and fix approach. It's, so it's saying this is what's right. going wrong, and this is how we need to correct the movement, and this is the part of the swing that's that's at fault, and this is how we need to change that swing. How does that fare as, as a way to get better at something as far as like, OK, I've done it. There's a, something obvious that you're doing wrong. And the coach tells you, no, 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 you're not, don't do it that way. Do it this way. Does, how does that fare in the research as far as getting someone better at any kind of skill, not just golf? The research now points in the favor of self-organized learning. So that's I would say that success rate is not particularly high. In uh, corrections, it's not, not high for corrections. Yeah. No. There are research. There is research out there about blocked, blocked, blocked learning. Um, but and but we know now the modern day, the modern literature and the modern research is talking about uh, variability in training, random and varied practice, uh, spacing and interleaving. 
literally all multitasking, asking the body to multitask, going from step, going from different tasks, from task to task to task, high level of variability. In respect to a, a corrective approach, it's quite a high level of failure too. And this right. is this is the this is the job of the coach to um, I think to find the right challenge point for the pupil because I mean it's okay failing, but it does require understanding from the pupil. But um, a high level of failure, obviously, that's not good for motivation. But, and there's study on that too. But um, it's that's the job of the coach to find the right the right level. So. I mean, there's, there's, there's papers out there that, are, I mean, they, they put an 85% su uh, success rate on it. That's the kind of optimal, these kind of 15% okay. error, error, error rate. So, uh, right, because in, in the traditional, like, one-hour golf lesson model, paying coach to, to make their golf swing better because they want to play better golf, right, at any, at any level. Everybody has basically the same kind of goal. They want to hit it better. They want the results to match up with what they were trying to do a lot closer. So yeah. in a regular golf lesson model, I can't imagine that me paying $300 or whatever it is for a golf lesson, going in to get a golf lesson, and then feeling at the end of my golf lesson that I'm hitting it way worse now and wanting to come back for another golf lesson, even though that might be the, the better way to learn for uh, stickiness and retention. If you're striping it in the golf lesson and you're, you're absolutely puring it by the end, there's a real high chance that – that won't stick with you come next week at all. So how do you balance that as a coach? That requires a level of understanding from the pupil. So it's important that the coach conveys exactly their their approach. I think if the if the if the coach has enough time to, I mean, I, I my lessons are now three hours. I don't do really less than a three hour lesson. So I right. I have people come for a half day or a full day um, or two days. Um, and so I recently had a lady from LA actually, and she came for two days and. Um, yeah, I think you need that. You need that volume of time, and they need to understand this journey. Uh, but there is success along the way. I mean, you'll see from my videos. I mean, that that happens every day. There have to be little morsels of what oh, could yeah. be possible, you know, because yeah. if, if it's just if it's just skunking the ball for for three hours, that's not going to be good. <laughs> there has to be a little bit like, oh, that's what my potential is. Yeah. If I hit a shot like that, I always knew I could hit a shot like that. Yeah, you're meeting their needs at the end of the day. You've got to meet their needs. As a coach, we've got to, they've got to be experienced in that pure hit. Uh, if, they're coming, if they're coming to a lesson and they want to draw it, they've got to go away drawing it or at least understand the process moving forward. But look, it's like any sport. Anybody can spin a ball. It's kind of, you don't have to be, you don't have to be Ronaldo to curve a ball to the right and curve a football to the left. Um, any, uh, I, get, I mean, my beginners... You got to get them. We get them curving the ball straight away and understanding then um, how their golf swing influences the ball flight, and then they can start to see perception and they can start to understand their action. So there's a coupling, a perception, perception, action coupling um, taking place. That's when you've struck gold, really, because then the they're on. They just start to. I mean, the lesson starts to really start really uh, snowball in respect to performance because. When the connections start to happen, um, they're playing around. I mean, the lessons tell me what they're changing. So they'll right. say, "I'm just changing. I'm just I'm moving around." But they don't. They're not telling me specific mechanics. They're just going, "I'm. I need to do this. I need to do that." And they're they're starting to tell me how they're uh, they're adapting their mechanics. So I'm not. I never ever tell anybody. Or if I do, I'm. I kind of. I have to check myself because I don't want to tell anybody how to move. I don't tell anybody how to grip. I don't tell anybody the, uh, the, the fundamentals. Um, I mean, I'm so in in any traditional golf book, and I probably should have started the interview with this. But in any traditional golf book, uh, probably hundreds of them, they start with grip first, then stance, then backswing, transition, downswing, all these things. And uh, but in the Hall of Fame, we we, uh, we see every type of grip, every type of stance, every type of backswing, every type of transition. And then as things get closer to the ball in the Hall of Fame, they start to narrow like the the delivery into the ball it starts to be a little more similar impact positions start to be incredibly similar um but as far as those things like fundamentals of grip stance you don't really tell people like how to, how to do that no it's uh, it's self it's self finding so i i um what i do is i invite the body i uh in, i invite the body i offer i i challenge the body 
um, into an opportunity for movement. So either that's grip or stance. So I use things like balance discs. Basically, what I do is I create a state of instability, so a state of chaos. Right. So if you create turbulence, if you kind of perturbate the system, the body starts to react in a very organized, orderly, efficient manner. Yeah. So it, it self-organizes very, very quickly. But that's the job of the coach to play around with the, the right constraints. So if, if you come in and as a coach, like you can tell it, like right away that this person is just moving way too much in the backswing and their, their sense of balance is just terrible. And, or maybe their sense of balance is good, but how they're using it is just very bad. They're moving off the ball and then wobbling, kind of like, you know, we see a swimming fish, kind of, yeah. they do that thing. Regularly, they would tell you, like, hey, look at your swing. You're moving around way too much. But what you're saying is, no, let's put them in an environment where they would be so unbalanced that they would force themselves to have to self-organize some actual balance so that they can bring it into their swing. Am I getting that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you if you stood them on, obviously it's not possible. For an example, you stood them on ice, things would start yeah. to change. I use sand, sand a lot, barefoot in sand, uh, sloping lies. You got someone who's moving a lot. You can put them on hanging lies and right. sloping, lies. and it's kind of you can start to use the the environment to manipulate the the movement. I think it's like learning to walk or learning to ice skate. Me and you go ice skating, and we're there at the rink, and I'm like. Brendan, I'm off. I want the penguin. That little penguin, kind of like a little stabilizer, like like it's like a Zimmer frame thing. I'm going round on this penguin, and you're there. Yeah, it's the uh, the, like the walker, the ice walker thing. The ice yeah. walker, yeah. So I'm using yeah. the ice walker, and I'm off, and I'm having a bit of fun, and I'm loving life, and you're like clambering on the side and falling all over and trying to find your feet, and right. but you're you're starting to learn about. You start to quickly find your feet. You might be hanging onto the side, and you you're looking a bit clumsy and foolish, and I'm I'm just I'm off and I'm about and chatting to you. You're ripping around, yeah. Loving it. But then you start to find your feet and then you're starting to get a bit of control, but you might not be able to stop. You might be hitting things, but you're getting used to the edges of the skates and you're getting used to the ice and you're getting used to, and you're starting to control your movement. And yeah. if we fast forward that four or five weeks and we've been going once a week, by week four or five, you're going to be whizzing around that rink and I'm still on the, uh, the walker. You take right. the, you take the walker away from me, and I'm back on I'm back on the floor, I'm back to yep. what, and I'm I'm way behind you, um. So that's that's that. I mean that that for me is how I explain kind of sometimes training aids. I think training aids can be a crutch. I think they can be right because so we, we did a big video a couple of weeks ago, and in the literature that I've seen, is the things that help you towards the correction actually will um, kind of retard your learning process. And uh, so actually, if you are going to use a training aid, it, it should be the job of the training aid to almost make what you're trying to do more difficult. Is, is that how you see it? It's got to amplify the variability. So I use a rocking board, the footboard. There's so many, yeah. move, there's so many uses for that. Um, but the, 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 first, the, the first one is that it's shifting, it's shifting your, your center of mass. And you're mm -hmm. having to use center of pressure. You're having to use your feet. You're having to control the body. And, it can it can seem like an exaggerated movement. I even use balance discs on top of that sometimes. So I've um, we're just about to on release top it. of like on you top, put a balance disc on top, top of the board. Yeah, yeah. So now yeah. you're affording even more movement, and the body's really got to organise. It's got to adjust its movement to rock the board. And what that's doing is it's it's heightening your proprioception. So it's heightening yeah. that self awareness of what you're actually doing. Um, and you, there's lots of other ways of of adding chaos to the system, um, uh, yeah. and that's really what you need to do. That's to, to find order. You need to add chaos, and and um, and that's for me. That's where the fundamentals start to emerge. So you're just like piling more difficult things, and they're like, okay, well, there's no way to do this task of golf swing or whatever it is. You know, the way I was doing it, I better start you know, figuring something else out or else I'm going to yeah. either fall or just won't make contact or, is that right? Yeah, we're, we're an adaptive species. We've, we've been on this planet like 12 million years. That's, and so evolution takes care of this. Um, the, that, the conscious brain thinks it's, it knows best. And we think, we think with the golf instruction books and things like this, that, that we can uh, override this system and that we know better we can tell to do. But what we're often doing is just adding more interference to the system. But, but yeah. 
kind of not really good noise. What I'm the chaos I, I, I intend to add in a session is what I would class as kind of useful noise, useful interference. Right. That kind of stuff is is probably not useful interference. And so it's creating a distortion. It's I would what did say, you say was not useful interference? Um, thinking about the golf swing, thinking about the, I mean, thinking about positions, thinking about, oh, okay. um, and kind of adding preconditions to the swing. When it, I think, what using, would a precondition be? Can use it well using conventional methods. Okay. Thinking about the golf swing already comes preloaded. People already have attachments. They already have a concept in their mind of what they have to do, and then they. They look at videos and then they start trying to adhere to something, and um, and it's that we're not we're adaptive species. We're supposed to adapt to the environment, and um, right. and so when we start to um, narrow our focus onto certain things, then we start to lose awareness of other things. We don't. We start to lose that ability to scan the environment and and uh, cue our movements from possibly more useful stimuli than me just thinking internally about some kind of position um, that I don't really have any awareness for in space. I mean, if right. you look at your golf swing, we've you've had people video their golf swings and look at the swing and it looks nothing like, uh, or it feels nothing like it looks. They go, well, I, don't, I can't believe I'm swinging like this. And it's like, well, if there's already a disconnection there, a disconnect between what's feel, what, what you feel and what's real, then we can't really use that system to affect a positive change. We've got to mm. use different and and so i mean i always say kind of the golf books came after the golf swing <laughs> so the golf swing came first and there were some really nice efficient swings beautiful swings functional and then they started writing books the literature the literature came after and then people started right. using the literature literature to learn the golf swing yeah for me i've done a full i've done a full 180 in how i approach teaching really what we also do then is kind of so what i do is maybe increase the loft of the golf club slightly. So now we might go to a, I don't know, six iron. Yeah, I got that. Six iron, all right. Yeah. So now a bit more loft. So this requires more adaptation. Really nice. That's awesome. Great move. Good. So we, what you're starting to do now is you're starting to, yeah, and you can play around with the slope, can play around with, then I would go ball to, position a, or... yeah, ball position, which I move the ball back. I mean, what I'd also do yeah, is um, a few practice swings with, uh, if you kind of shift, shift an imaginary ball position and just move the ball further forward in the stance. So now you've oh, got, okay. got you. in the stance and now you've got to hit it down underneath. So, so I'm like scuffing the ground like way out here. Yeah, you're going to start to have to move. And you could, I'd do this probably off a level lie though, Brendan, to be honest. I'd probably use a level lie so you yeah. could move. So, and then you would, you would be scuffing the ground kind of in line with the, that's it, but feel, but trying to play the draw swing. So trying to play a draw shot with it. So okay. So, so those now, are kind of ca counter, counter uh, indicated things like the super forward ball position, but then play a draw. Yeah. Shot. Now, so it's real. Now you're gonna, now you're gonna have to start to shift the body in a certain way. You're gonna have to shift the, shift quite excessively to move the low point to get the strike. Feels pretty good. Yeah. And so you're starting to starting to move differently in relation to the that those environmental constraints, and also what you're trying to achieve here. You're trying to, yeah, we're trying to visualize, if you like, that ball flight. And then we need to lengthen the swing. 